Well, hello everyone. We're getting towards the end, so um, yeah, which is, which is um, so. Thanks for coming on Saturday and um, and seeing what's going. I'm very very excited about all these papers we're seeing today for, for different reasons. Um, and so yeah, it's going to be a very big pleasure to chair this session. Um, I'd like to say we're on Gadigal land, unceded Gadigal land, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, and I'd like to say that I'm here with humility and respect and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people here. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, which is Laura Case. Um, Laura is a PhD candidate here at the Conservatorium. Um, she also works here as a tutor and research assistant, um, and she's a proud Radjuri woman from the central west of New South Wales and a classical violinist with over 20 years of experience. And her paper today is called Growing Up Aboriginal, a Candid Reflection on the Importance of Representation in Musical Programming. So please make Laura welcome. Thanks, Toby. Um, yeah, I'll also start by just acknowledging we're on unceded Gadigal land. Um, as Toby said, I'm Wiradjuri, so it's important for me to acknowledge I'm not on my own land. Um, and there's been really rich and amazing musical traditions happening on this country for a long time before this building was here. So let's start by going back approximately 23 years back. <laughs> I was a spirited four-year-old at this time, <laughs> surrounded by a very large extended family in Lithgow on Wiradjuri country. I saw the violin on Sesame Street and asked my parents if I could learn. Amazingly, given that no one in my family plays any form of music, uh, they said yes. <laughs> and so began my love affair with the violin. Uh, my parents never forced me to practice, and I don't remember a time where the violin wasn't my entire existence, and I can't really put into words how much I love the violin. <laughs> At preschool, primary school and high school, I was known as that kid who played the violin. Um, it feels like I have always been defined by the violin, given that I grew up in a rural town, um, I had a lot of teachers as they moved through town, and when my parents realised that this obsession seemed to have stuck and I wasn't going to give up, um, they decided to try and find a better teacher for me. So twice a week after school, when I was around 13, my mum would drive me over an hour each way just for lessons and to play with Bathurst Chamber Orchestra. Uh, when it came time for me to start HSC preparation in senior high school, it became clear that I wasn't going to get the support I needed at my local high school for me to formally study music um, at university and move to the big city like I'd always dreamed. <laughs> Um, I was lucky to receive a scholarship for years 11 and 12, and I travelled over an hour each way every day to and from school just so I could study music. Shortly after I moved schools, I was accepted into Sydney Youth Orchestra, and at that point, my parents became real champions, um, and they drove me over three hours each way, sometimes two to three times a week, just so I could play. Um, with Sydney Youth Orchestra, we performed Sibelius, Tchaikovsky, Beethoven, and this was my first exposure to a lot of these symphonics works. As we left rehearsals, I would listen to everyone discuss the glorious sounds of the various works. Elated, excited, and happy, which melody would you get as a tattoo? So hard to choose, they would say. <laughs> and I just felt like I was missing something. You, you couldn't doubt that I loved the violin, but something in this repertoire just, it didn't click. It didn't make me feel excited like I saw in all these other people. Even when performing solo sonatas and concertos, I just didn't feel this joy that everybody seemed to when they were discussing works and it just made me feel like I was going crazy sometimes. I went on to study music at an undergrad level and I loved every second of my music classes. I got up every morning and I practiced at 6am in the church across the road from my share house. <laughs> I loved my teacher, I looked forward to every lesson, but despite everything, I still felt this lack of connection to the repertoire that you had to learn if you're going to be a classical violinist. And I thought maybe I just needed to work harder. I needed to understand more, play more, invest more. It, I just couldn't understand. I loved my violin so much. So, and this is how you play the violin. So the issue just had to be me. I played in every orchestra I could manage, even once I'd graduated and I was working full time. I rehearsed late into the night, sometimes multiple nights a week. And I left sore, tired and flat, while others excitedly discussed how performing Ravel was the highlight of their week. Why didn't I feel this way? In 2022, 
Ryan Clapham, whose rapper name is Dobby, an Aboriginal man with ancestral ties to Brawarana, asked me to play for a gig he was putting together called Warangu. He wanted all Black Indigenous people of colour players, and despite my hesitation at the exhaustion that and hurt that inevitably follows a late night rehearsal, I agreed. I ran out of time to even glance through the scores prior to our first rehearsal, rehearsal and I rushed there after a long week, my body was heavy, and he said, hey, let's just run through the program. And I tell you what, the experience was instant elation. All these years hearing people gush about Mozart, for the first time in my life, I got it and I became the gusher. <laughs> I nearly burst into tears after that rehearsal on the, on the way home. My partner picked me up from the art gallery and I just gushed the whole way home. And I said, why haven't you said anything? He said, I cannot get a word in. <laughs> um, despite my love affair with the violin lasting my entire life, this had never happened before. So why? What's different? We rehearsed until past midnight. We rehearsed 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning. And I tell you, that would normally make me cry. <laughs> Hearing culture and country represented in Warangu and playing with mob, it was just such a game changer for my musical journey. I experienced in real time the disconnect when only a bunch of old dead white guys are programmed, to be honest. This paper is certainly not to suggest that they do not get programmed, rather that they are not solely programmed or to be the only works that are ascribed with value or musical or historical importance. Today, we know that representation is important. Um, I wanna play a really short video here. I'm sure plenty of you have seen these videos, but I think it just really perfectly illustrates why representation is important. So it's of some young girls reacting to the Little Mermaid trailer that has just come out. Um, apologies for this warning that YouTube will give you. Um, it has nothing to do with Al Jazeera or the Qatari government. <laughs> To try not to cry every single time I watch these videos. <laughs> I think it's just such a powerful depiction of exactly why representation in the media matters. Everyone, but particularly children, need to see themselves represented. Now, I'm thinking about these ideas not only in relation to my own experience as a violinist, but also in my approach to writing a social history of the violin in Australia for my doctoral research. When I commenced this research, I found that so much of the writing about music in Australia tends to start with the arrival of the British, even though music was being, has been being made on this land for thousands of years prior to their arrival. Further, I felt that broad histories of music in Australia seem to focus on Western art music endeavours and concert culture in an effort to convey the achievements of Australians as equal to those of Europeans and accordingly be taken more seriously on a global scale. However, this perpetuates the stereotype that only Western art music is of inherent value. I grappled with the question, how to write about a European instrument when being interacted with and played by the traditional inhabitants of the land who have their own musical traditions. And what does it mean? What does this mean for the music being made? What does it mean for us as indigenous people to play Western repertoire on Western instruments? To solely play, oh, well, I just said that. <laughs> to solely program the works of Western European classical composers is not only inherently problematic, but it also does not capture the true diversity and scope of all that has been achieved and created within the musical industry. We as musicians know the true importance and the power of music. We regu regularly advocate for the benefits of and access to music for all children, regardless of their background and circumstance. However, continuing to solely teach, program and represent one type of work or composer stands in stark contradiction to this, 
and seems to indicate that only those people are of worth and represent value. It further perpetuates the stereotype that only Western art music is of value, and this is reminiscent of the assimilatory attempts of Aboriginal children. Western art music was regularly taught to Aboriginal people on sites of segregation as a means of demonstrating civility and as preparation for entry into white Australian society. Anna Habick writes that teaching music was a strategy to render them contented and happy and replace their savage customs with the enjoyment of European civilization. This article from 1950, titled Aboriginal is a Gifted Problem Girl, informs readers that Mercy, the only full blood violinist in the North, refuses to go back to her tribe. The article proceeds to provide an explicit description of the perceived corrective influence of the violin on Aboriginal people. It tells how Mercy was raised as the only full blood on the mission at Garden Point in Melville Island after she was taken as a baby from her mother, who was an inmate, at the Channel Island Leprosarium. The article goes on to detail that when Mercy's father finally found her, she was, quote, grown up and sophisticated and had no desire to return to the tribal life which she had never known, unquote. The article ends by reading, no one knows what is going to happen to Mercy, this full blood native with a white woman's education. What happens to her and her violin may easily serve as a pointer to the future of the Northern Territory Aborigines. The fact that Mercy has mastered the art of playing the violin is used as evidence that she should not have to return to her uncivilized roots, but is also used as further evidence that Aboriginal people can be civilized when exposed to a European education. This article makes me quite sad because this could have been me had I been born in the 1900s. Does this mean I'm evidence of successful assimilation when I use my violin to play Western art music? What does it mean for me to play the violin today? While the violin may have been used as a means of civilizing Aboriginal people, the fact that Aboriginal people continue to play the violin when not being prescribed to on the, miss on the mission does not mean the civilizing mission was a success. Music is a valuable tool for the resistance of cultural persecution, as it can hold and preserve Indigenous knowledge, language and culture. The diverse and fluid nature of music challenges the inclination of power to homogenize and illustrates the flaws in colonial attempts to control cultures, traditions, values and beliefs. There are various examples of Indigenous people adapting to the style which has become synonymous with oppressive regimes in an effort to both avoid and resist total absorption into the official culture of colonialism and ensure the survival of their own cultural identity. Similarly, Aboriginal people used music in the creation and preservation of both individual, cultural and collective identities. Accordingly, it seems likely that historically, Aboriginal people may not necessarily have seen the violin as a European form of music making, but rather as a means of engaging with their own cultural and collective identity in a, way, in a way that aligned with their traditional experience. One of the most explicit examples of the violin being adapted as a means of cultural continuity comes from Peter Jetta. He was a Noongar man born around 1872 who lived on the New Norsha mission, where he was taught the violin by Bishop Salvador. Habeck writes that Jetta played the violin for local dances, weddings, and Noongar-only campfire gatherings in the bush, where old and new songs and dances mingled together, reviving flagging spirits with the healing joy of being together as they had for millennia. The fact that Jetta played his violin at Noongar-only campfire gatherings in the bush is an interesting idea that illustrates how the violin aligned with Aboriginal people's traditional experience of making music when not on the missions, where music was prescribed in a particular way. This hybrid fusion of music illustrates how Jetta used the violin as a form of cultural continuation, expression, identity, and how a sense of community between Indigenous people was enhanced and maintained. I thought that to feel connected with my heritage, I had to sing in language, or that I had to play a traditional instrument. And given that this knowledge has not, has not been passed down directly to my family, I didn't know where to start. To maintain Indigenous knowledge today where my story of loss is not unique, these stories of adaptation and representation is, I believe, necessary. Dawn Avery uses the works of three native classical composers in her chapter, Native Classical Music Now, to illustrate some of the ways in which native classical contemporary performances and compositions, quote, embody memories of place and personal experience, recontextualizing and resituating the past to be useful in the present and the future. Her analysis suggests that rather than directly quoting native musical sources or imbuing their work with a cultural flavor, these composers strategically deploy musical hybridity, cross-cultural competency, collaboration, and audience participation 
to decolonize the listener's reception of Indigenous music. The unexpectedness of Indigenous musical modernity creates dilemmas for First Nations musicians whose authenticity is repeatedly challenged or who may find themselves hovering on the margins of expected styles of expression for Native people as defined by the settler and colonist dominated music industry. However, increasingly, Indigenous performers are no longer confined to creating music in relation to white expectations. Using a mix of Western instruments, the voices of his mob, the sounds of his country, Warango came into my life and in a big way shattered expectations that I didn't even realize I held. Ryan writes, Warango means river, any river, water source or creek. Warango is a collection of cultural knowledge of three rivers that form the surrounding tribal boundaries in Brewarrina, New South Wales. The stories follow the Bogan River to the south, the Colgol River to the north, and the Barwon River to the east. Warango is a journey back home to my family's history, a connection to culture. One of my favourite works in the show is called Dippy You and Patchalinya, and it contains the sounds of the Pied Butcher Bird. Dippy You and Patchalinya means the bird names himself. Ryan awoke early one morning to the sounds of the Pied Butcher Bird that you will hear in the opening. It was around 6 a.m. and he was sleeping on a stretcher bed on his aunt's veranda. He says he knew the bird was so close, so special and so loud that he slowly reached out and grabbed his recorder next to him. So let's have a little listen to Dippy. I think by army telling us he can see ya uh, Dippy, you on Patulina Home to the Nuno, the continuing dream I am by well one, you're rather right a Camilla Roy Mudawari, Bakanji, Wakamara, the Barabinia uh, uh, Dippy, you on Patulina Singing his name throughout the Riverina I see the cook of Barbara Malia Dinner wine, I know the dinner wine A spiritual creature uh, Dippy, you on Patulina See the moon that better come out the river And they call him wild way at the bar When I watch him transform like the butterfly and the caterpillar uh, I got no confidence in our current leader I'm sick of suffering, smirk, smothering emphysema Towering flames, howling chirp The entire reese curves from cans all the way down to Bega Listen to a different thinker Cause somebody trying to give you the bigger picture And take what I learned to understand That the lessons in the rivers in the land I was favorite teacher Um, the recorded bird call inspired this work, and Ryan has seamlessly melded it with the sounds of strings and brass to create a masterpiece that holds connection to country, culture, and authenticity through diverse and fluid means. In addition to Ryan, artists like Deborah Cheatham, 
Aaron Wyatt and Eric Avery are succeeding in the industry on their own terms, continually grappling with the question, how do we render Indigenous thought into musical form? They each use music to advance Indigenous sovereignty, resurgence and intergenerational healing in critical ways. The process of decolonization is a constructive and healing force for Natives and non-Natives alike. Native classical composers embody this decolonizing force by presenting Indigenous worldviews and new artistic creations in performances directed at diverse audiences. Native classical composition serves as a means through which we represent ourselves as Indigenous, to some unexpectedly, and they are part of a gift that drives us as creative beings who are also Indigenous. Thank you so much, Laura. That was um, really, really wonderful and, and important presentation. And I love how you talk about your own experience and then explore this, you know, this really interesting and I think for a lot of people unknown history yeah. of the violin in, in, in Indigenous <laughs> Australia. Um, yeah, it's really wonderful. So I might just go straight to some questions, I think. Miff, now, where's the microphone? Ah, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. I know this is your personal experience. I was thinking whether you've looked into um, other cultures that might have similarly embraced the so-called you know, other, um, which are previously were associated with exclusion that they may yeah. have indigenous people. Yeah, I, I have. <laughs> I've recently read, um, I can't think of the title of it now. But I read a really interesting paper about how the violin has been incorporated into um, indigenous Mexican communities. And I read um, another really interesting paper about um, the violin being incorporated into Native American um, communities as well. And that, I think, has also really inspired me to feel, um, you know, that there's a lot of dialogue out there for other countries as well, I think. And that's that's really helped me to kind of grapple with this question of how how I interact with a Western instrument. But it's, yeah, it's interesting to see how it's been incorporated into native forms of repertoire as well, where I feel it hasn't always been here. Um, I mean, Eric Avery is an excellent example of where it has been done really well. Um, he's just like, the violin is not even separate to him, it's just totally part of him and his expression. And so um, I find that really inspiring as well to see how he's able to render that, that question of how do we represent ourselves as indigenous when our instrument is not Indigenous. And so, yeah, I've, I've read a lot about communities, other communities around the world, but particularly um, this one about the Mexican communities and how they've kind of adapted the violin to, like it went from being the European violin into this kind of hybrid instrument that's now used in their own repertoire. It's really interesting, yeah. Oh. We have a question on Zoom. From Harriet. Oh, hi. Yeah, hi. thank you. That was fantastic. Um, I was really interested as a as a fiddle player myself. So how it's you one gets so compelled by an instrument, even it, at, while at the same time the music that you're playing, the the repertoire isn't necessarily striking a chord. Uh, sorry, uh, striking chord with you. <laughs> um, uh, um, what was it about the violin that um, that really grabbed you? I honestly have no idea. <laughs> um, Mum and Dad, if you ask them, I was a very naughty child and um, the violin just helped me to calm down. <laughs> like every time I felt myself getting worked up, there was just something about the violin that helped me really like unwind. And I still find that true today. Like if I do find myself getting really seriously worked up, the violin seems to just... I don't know, it kind of helped me unwind. And it wasn't that I was playing repertoire, it was just the physical experience of holding the violin and having it with me. And I think it's quite an intimate instrument, like you hold mm. it right under your chin. And I think that I found quite soothing, particularly as a kid. Um, 
but no one in my family plays music at all. And so they were just kind of like, is this nice? <laughs> I'm sure that the first few years they did not feel that way. But once I got a little bit better. <laughs> we have time for another question. If anyone in the audience here or on Zoom would like to ask one. Yes, Chris, coming to you right now. <laughs> Um, thanks so much, Laura, for that uh, wonderful presentation. You've done quite a lot of teaching at the conservatorium now, and uh, I'm wondering, um, I've been trying to formulate this question, you know, if there was, um, if this was a This Is Music lecture, which is our sort of introductory music course, and there was one thing that you wanted all conservatorium students to start their degree knowing, um, you know, from your experience, is there a pithy summary or is there no way of summing it up? <laughs> I think just to keep an open mind, like, you know, like I, I was really taught quite traditionally, like all my teachers were very traditional. And so I didn't understand that. I felt that to be a violinist, you had to learn, you know, you go from the accolade concerto to the, you know, you start doing your Mozart sonatas and then you start doing it and you move through that. but that didn't ever resonate with me and I didn't ever feel seen. And so I would just say, you know, like it's so important to take that journey and find out that there are other things out there that might resonate. So, yeah, I guess, I don't know. That's what I'd say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I might just quickly ask one question. Laura, <laughs> seeing us on the chair, I think we've got another minute. So. Um, I just think it's so fantastic that, you know, you got involved in a project with, with, with Dobby, you know, I just mm. think like, what would have happened if that hadn't come along, I know. you know? <laughs> I, think, I think I was on a journey to discovering that anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and Dobby and I had had a number of conversations um, just about various things. And I think I was on the journey to kind of working out how to render my Indigenous thought into music, which is something I'd been really struggling with. And he was kind of the catalyst for that. But I think it, it had been bubbling away. <laughs> but yes, no, I'm very glad that um, he did invite, I, I actually said no a few times. Um, so I'm glad that he kind of wore me down and yeah. <laughs> the, the piece of music you played, and I, you know, because Dobby's obviously a hip hop artist, and the piece of music you played, you know, the way the, the violins are used reminds me of the way of sampling. So it sounds yes. almost like sampled, the way it's, you, you sampled violins. Yeah. And was that something that was, it was a different way of approaching how you might was that talked yeah. about? That yeah, kind of... a little bit. Like that is not the final, mm -hmm. the final recording because that is still being mixed, um, right. which we will have sometime next year. Um, but yeah, so he did kind of approach it by sampling and using things like that at first and then kind of started to, so there was us as strings, um, Lolita who presented yesterday. Um, she was on the keys and oh. she did vocals as well. And um, then there was also some guys on um, trumpet trombone I want to say that I can't remember I think trumpet trombone and flute slash sax so yeah it all just kind of came together and it was amazing yeah, yeah. <laughs> well thank you so much thank and, um, you. please Thanks. join me in thanking Laura one more time for that <laughs>